I'm Murray Miles. I'm the co-convener of the Frog chapter. Uh, one of my co-conveners is here today, uh, Ron Thompson. <laughs> the other was unfortunately not able to make it due to illness. I uh, had to cancel at the last minute, unfortunately. So that's uh, John Bonnet of the History Department. Ron, by the way, is an applied linguistics. Uh, this is, uh, as I say, the inaugural event of our chapter, which came into existence after the recent unfortunate uh, events uh, concerning the distinguished uh, rock scientist Thomas Hudlitsky. Uh, I perhaps before I introduce uh, today's speaker, I'll just say a word about the staffs, since uh, many of you may not know anything at all or not very much about the organization, or may have heard things about the organization that I'm speaking. Uh, SAFS, the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship, uh, pursues two main aims. One is the maintenance of uh, freedom in teaching and research for professors, of course, but also uh, defending the corresponding freedom of uh, students. The other uh, main SAFS goal is maintaining standards of excellence in, uh, in uh, the assessment of faculty and uh, students. Uh, and uh, that means uh, really the use of academic criteria exclusively in the evaluation of professors and uh, students. These are values that are very much uh, under attack in the university uh, community these days, as I hardly need to uh, point out. Uh, our speaker today is Mark Mercer, who is the uh, president of the national organization, the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship, which comprises some, well, well over 300 uh, university academics right across the country. And uh, SAPS has several local chapters like this one one at McGill, for example, another at Waterloo. And uh, I imagine that uh, more such chapters will be forming at other uh, universities across the country. Mark is uh, an indefatigable uh, speaker, writer, defender of the uh, values uh, that uh, staff, uh, staff stands for. Um, he's uh, a philosopher in the philosophy department at uh, St. Mary's University in Halifax. His uh, specific interests within philosophy are in ethics on the one hand and uh, philosophy of mind on the other. He's made valuable contributions to specialized, specialist journals in these, in these areas. Uh, uh, of his publications, I'll only mention perhaps uh, a recent book, of which he has uh, a copy here, uh, In Praise of the Dangerous University. Uh, this, it's published by the Frontier Center. You can order it on Amazon. And Mark actually has a couple of copies uh, with him, if anybody wants to pick one up after uh, his talk. You can, this is one of those uh, <clears throat> books where uh, reading the title, it's uh, not terribly difficult to conjecture, at least part of the uh, contents. Uh, so, without further ado, I don't want to infringe further on uh, Mark's turn. Mark will speak for about uh, 40 minutes, and then we hope to have. Uh, a lively uh, general discussion of the issues that he raised. His title is Freedom of Expression on Campus. What are the issues? Please welcome Mark Mercer. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, John and, and Ron and Murray for inviting me and, uh, and, and setting this up. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm delighted uh, to be here. Uh, I'm not going to speak for more than 40 minutes. I hope it's just half an hour and we can get into uh, questions and answers and discussion and the rest. 
Well, as, uh, as Marty mentioned, freedom of expression on campus, wide freedom of expression on campus, is not faring terribly well in Canadian universities and uh, universities uh, uh, worldwide, uh, certainly um, in, in the Anglosphere. Um, the, there are manifestations of hostility to wide freedom of expression on campus that we're familiar with, uh, things like disinviting speakers, uh, defunding offending groups and publications, inflating security costs, disruptive protests, uh, calling for heads to roll, um, which, occurs, which does happen, complaining to sponsors, um, and in, in that way directing what can and can't be said on campus, um, refusing uh, people refusing to join panel discussions. Uh, I, We've had this in the past at, at, at SAS, we want to have a panel discussion and uh, feature two or three uh, different sides and uh, um, people on the um, sides that we, we invite them off and say, no, we don't want to uh, uh, participate. Um, then there's the uh, vandalism of, uh, of uh, posters, um, censoriousness, shaming, exclusion. Uh, these things uh, are occurring at a much greater frequency uh, than they did before. I don't think there's ever been a golden age. Let me put that out there. <laughs> there's never been a golden age. I think things uh, uh, go up and go down. Uh, things get better, things get worse. There's never been a golden age for freedom of expression on campus, but I think we're now in, uh, if, uh, we're in a trough, if not on the uh, on the downhill. Now, so what I want to do is uh, begin by talking about reasons for opposing freedom of expression on campus. And I want to give uh, six or seven uh, what I take to be um, interesting and important reasons uh, why someone might oppose wide freedom of expression on campus. And by wide freedom of expression on campus, I include academic freedom, of course, uh, but also um, the uh, uh, freedom of uh, students and other members of the campus community to uh, engage in discussions to uh, say what they like to organize uh, uh, panels, movie nights, uh, to uh, engage in artistic um, uh, productions, um, and, and all the rest. So um, wide freedom of expression on campus, uh, not simply academic freedom, uh, but freedom of expression. And when I talk about freedom of expression on campus, um, I'm not going to bring in um, what I take to be general arguments about uh, the importance of uh, freedom of expression as a, uh, uh, something in, in, in political society. Uh, I want my, uh, my arguments, my remarks to uh, have to do with education or have to do with the, uh, uh, the, the, the purpose, the, the point of, of a university. So my arguments are, are somewhat narrow in that regard. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> this isn't an, um, a defense of freedom of expression on campus uh, as a human right or something like that. Um, you know, what does it contribute uh, to what we take to be the purposes and points of the uh, of the university? And likewise, I think the arguments against uh, wide freedom of expression on campus are ones that stem from an idea or perhaps an ideal of university life, uh, the purpose and point of the university, what a university is for. So some reasons why um, you know, members of the university communities are uh, these days opposing wide freedom of expression on campus. Well, what people say, and also sometimes how they say it, what people say, how they say it, can put at risk valued laws, practices, and institutions. Uh, that's one reason. Let me give an example. In Canada today, uh, you might think that our laws and policies with regard to abortion are pretty well as good as they are, as they can get in uh, the contemporary world. Uh, you might favor the um, ease of access uh, to safe abortion in Canada. Worries about Prince Edward Island and uh, problems of access to abortion there, uh, certainly. Uh, but um, abortion on demand um, into the third trimester, maybe in the third trimester there might be medical panels or something like that, to determine whether the, uh, uh, the risk to the, uh, the pregnant woman's life is, uh, is you know, great enough. But at any rate, even um, uh, 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 third trimester abortion and uh, funded by, um, by our medical plans. You think, well, this is great. Uh, it could be better, but boy, could it be a lot worse. 
And the thought is, well, if we have a discussion about the ethics of abortion or about um, abortion in Canada, uh, there's no way to go but down. Uh, this discussion can't make things better. Uh, it can only make things worse. How can it make things worse? Well, by galvanizing the, uh, uh, the pro-life forces, uh, by uh, bringing pro-life arguments into the public sphere, then it might find that they move. Uh, certain people, uh, other institutions, practices, whatever, that are potentially put at risk, uh, even by uh, academic discussion, uh, well, um, well-conducted academic discussion, maybe immigration, capital punishment, uh, health care, uh, education, um, you might think that things are pretty good with regard to one or another of these areas uh, of policy in Canada, and that a wide open discussion of the thing can't but put it at risk. Maybe the risk is small, but still it's some risk, and uh, so not to, uh, uh, not to take that risk. Uh, one example uh, from my own <coughs> case, I'm the uh, uh, I speak uh, on the, uh, the pro-choice side at debates when I get a chance, because there aren't many debates, because um, many pro-choice people won't, uh, won't, won't, won't debate, but I will. Um, and so one of the uh, uh, debates I was at, a very formal affair, and nonetheless organized uh, pro-choice uh, people would put state moms on the chairs. Right. Uh, and so uh, uh, this is um, an academic uh, exercise uh, investigating the ethics of, uh, uh, of abortion. Uh, but the idea is that to discuss these things openly, candidly, even in an academic forum, is to put the practice, the, the institution, of uh, um, uh, safe, legal, easily accessible abortion at risk. Um, <clears throat> another reason people have for opposing wide freedom of expression on campus is that there's the possibility that racist, sexist, homophobic, anti-trans, etc. attitudes uh, will be spoken, even if not, um, even if not endorsed, uh, they'll be spoken. And um, that puts out, that creates the possibility of uh, discriminatory practices uh, in, the, uh, in, in the real world. Uh, making uh, work, housing, health care, and the rest more difficult for members of marginalized or, or historically oppressed groups to obtain. So again, the thought is the, uh, the risk of discussing um, fully, uh, robustly in public um, matters in these areas uh, can't really produce a lot of good, uh, but it can produce a lot of harm. There's a risk of, even if it's a small risk, there's a, a risk of harm. Um, an example of that might be uh, Philip Kitcher, the uh, philosopher of science. Uh, he has a, a very influential uh, and a famous paper where he argues that um, people should, academics should avoid research into the differences between sexes, um, into differences between races, into differences between, say, uh, um, people with uh, homosexual preferences people with heterosexual preferences. Now, he doesn't indeed, he doesn't in fact endorse his conclusions. Uh, he thinks the, uh, that the conclusions are, um, uh, are interesting and need to be discussed, but many people do endorse the, the, the conclusion that uh, one ought not to investigate racial differences or sexual differences or uh, differences between people who have, who have different sexual preferences. And the, the, argument, the argument is this, uh, even if these studies show something that we would be happy to learn um, that, for instance, there's um, um, you know, no good reason to think that uh, you know, black people are better at something than white people, or even if they uh, present us with results that we're um, happy, to, uh, uh, ha happy to learn. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the reaction will be this. Uh, one, either you already know this, and, and so it's not going to matter to you. Uh, or if you uh, are inclined toward uh, bigotry, uh, prejudice, and the like, uh, you're going to say, well, more study needs to be done. Um, you know, either criticize the, uh, the study or say, well, this is just one preliminary result. Uh, so his claim is that the, um, uh, the results of such inquiry cannot, well, will very unlikely have any socially positive result, 
but they could have socially negative results. So stay away from those areas. Don't investigate those areas. And you might say something like, well, it's a fascinating area. It's an interesting uh, thing to do. Well, if you're interested in one thing, you're interested in all sorts of things. So take on some other research project. Right? So this is, uh, uh, he himself does not um, um, oppose wide freedom of expression on campus. He offers this as an argument to us as individual academics. Uh, uh, think carefully about your choice of research topic <laughs> is, the, uh, is, is the upshot from, uh, from his view. But other people have taken it further and said something like, well, the university as an institution itself uh, should make it difficult for researchers, even researchers of goodwill, uh, to investigate things like differences between uh, racial groups or differences between the sexes, differences between uh, people who have uh, different sexual preferences. Uh, just because um, the social utility is likely nil, the risk of harm is at least positive, even if it's small. Uh, another argument for opposing the white freedom of expression on campus is uh, to note that what people say can create an unpleasant or hostile campus work or learning environment, uh, that uh, hearing uh, certain things, uh, even, uh, again, not uh, necessarily endorsed, but brought up as a subject of discussion, you know, uh, why are they talking about racial differences one more time? Right? Oh, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to hear this. Uh, it can create unpleasant and hostile environments, and uh, that can make both research and learning more difficult. The unpleasant or hostile environment can make research uh, difficult, can make learning more difficult, particularly in the cases of people from marginalized or historically oppressed groups. This in turn, right, the uh, unpleasant environment in which to study can create the leaky pipeline. Uh, people from historically marginalized or oppressed groups less likely to complete uh, their uh, bachelors uh, because of the uh, unpleasant environment, thus less likely to take their positions in the managerial and professional elite uh, that the universities are, uh, uh, with, uh, are, are, according to many people, uh, part of the purpose is for the, uh, part of the purpose of the university is to uh, uh, create uh, young people who can take their positions within the managerial and professional elite. Uh, so if people from racial and um, uh, ethnic uh, um, uh, cultural backgrounds uh, who find the university environment unpleasant are leaving the university, then they're not taking their positions in the managerial and professional elite, and uh, these uh, uh, society as a whole suffers uh, for that. Um, instill a sense in minority students that their belonging is precarious. Right? That uh, uh, they might be welcome today, but maybe not tomorrow. This is an argument that um, uh, I associate with uh, um, uh, Jeremy Waldron uh, from the early uh, 2000, maybe 2005 or so. Uh, he was making this argument about um, public spaces generally, about society generally. Uh, why, uh, you know, um, erase the graffiti, sure, but erase the racist graffiti immediately. Um, why so? Because it because not erasing it immediately communicates a certain tolerance for racist attitudes, and that can put uh, people of uh, uh, certain uh, races or ethnic heritages uh, uh, feeling that uh, the society in which they're in, their acceptance is only provisional, that uh, it's, uh, it's precarious. Um, Finally, um, a reason for opposing wide freedom of expression is that it lowers the campus tone to have people speaking about certain things. Um, charlatans, firebrands come on campus and the tone of the institution is lowered because of that. Harms the university's reputation detracts from its mission as an institution of uh, significant research and preparation of young people. Um, so these are, um, I don't think these are, uh, this is an exhaustive list of reasons uh, people have, um, and maybe it's overlapping in some ways, but I think these are some of the core reasons uh, why people uh, oppose wide freedom of expression on campus. Uh, so what do they put in its place? Well, they want safe and respectful campus policies, um, administrators to oversee uh, what's happening on campus, uh, vetting committees for uh, university groups who want to bring speakers onto campus, 
um, may be, and this has happened at some universities, uh, I, hope it, I hope it stops, but uh, submit your syllabus to the dean before it goes to the students for approval. Um, just to um, vet and control, and if need be, uh, censor that uh, which um, uh, may uh, put at risk valued institutions or lower the campus tone or, or whatever. So the solution then is, an over, uh, is a university of oversight and control. The university of oversight and control would minimize the risk and, uh, uh, and minimize the hurt and um, have um, means of redress uh, should uh, something slip by uh, the censors and the vetters. Okay. Now, there are responses to each of these um, uh, objections to wide freedom of expression on campus. Um, uh, Jonathan Haidt, for instance, talks about how the, um, the, 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 the painful psychological effects of uh, coddling uh, students and coddling professors. Um, uh, you might think also that uh, abortion is not as uh, uh, abortion as an institution in Canada is not seriously at risk. Um, I, when I wrote this, it was before the decisions in the United States that <laughs> well, maybe maybe it could be at risk in Canada. Uh, but uh, there are. Um, uh, individual responses, uh, two or three responses to each of the uh, uh, to each of the points I made. Um, but I want what I want to try to do is um, sketch an idea from which we can get a, a, a general uh, response against um, restrictions on freedom of expression on campus. Um, a way of thinking about freedom of expression on campus that uh, indicates its importance to us. And uh, even if there are these risks, we might say, well, we're willing to take these risks uh, for, the, for the good that we get. But I want to note, first of all, that before I get to my crazy arguments, I want to note that uh, the University of Oversight and Control is the standard university for most of the history of universities. It's not like our contemporary University of Oversight and Control is a new phenomenon. It's a new phenomenon in many ways. Uh, nothing ever happens exactly the same. Uh, but uh, this is the way universities have been um, uh, throughout history, until maybe uh, you know, uh, in the late 50s or 60s when they opened up and now, now closing back down again. Uh, the universities that have a religious uh, mission, universities that are founded by churches, um, military colleges, um, the idea there would be, these are universities of doctrine, universities of dogma. There's the doctrine of the dogma, and that these values like, contain what can happen within the university. The central core values are not to be questioned, um, except in the most um, you know, um, um, easy way uh, to show what the arguments are in favor of them. Uh, but um, at some universities in the past, uh, perhaps at some uh, uh, private religious universities uh, in the world today, uh, you can't, as a faculty member, um, uh, object to uh, a piece of dogma within the, uh, the founding charter of the uh, uh, religious institution. Uh, and yet, uh, research and teaching go on in these institutions. They're circumscribed, right? They're, they're borders. You can't pass those borders uh, without um, uh, suffering, uh, perhaps loss of the job. Um, but um, you know, th there are um, topics one can't uh, investigate freely. There are things one cannot say, at least things that one cannot endorse. This is how universities have been for a long, long time, and the sort of university that I'm going to try to describe, even though I think it's an idea of a university that's been present since the beginning of universities. I think it's always been a minority view, even among people in university communities. Minority view, even among people in university communities, until maybe around the 50s or 60s, uh, when it started, uh, when uh, religious universities started giving themselves over to the state, and the state had some idea of state neutrality with regard to higher education. Uh, but uh, uh, maybe um, things are closing in again. Uh, contemporary 
um, advocates of universities of oversight and control, I want to say, do have good models to look to, good models from the past uh, to look to and to try to emulate the um, uh, contemporary hostility to freedom of expression on campus uh, is, uh, I think, trying to recreate the functions and the ethos of traditional universities, especially uh, universities that have uh, a, a, a religious uh, background or a religious, uh, a religious founding. Now, the aims of the traditional university, and then I might include the aims of the coming university or the university we find ourselves in as being a transitional period. The aims of the university were to try, were to train students for careers, um, principally in management professions, so that the students could take their place among the elites. To train students for citizenship, that is to have the right, uh, to have the right attitudes, values, habits, and sympathies to be good citizens to be socially responsible. And in being socially responsible, to connect your personal concern to live well uh, to the well-being of the community. And uh, you know, that is fundamentally a goal of any religious college or, or, or university. Uh, we're, we care about you as a person, and we want you to live well, but we want your living well to contribute to, uh, uh, to the society as a whole to the general good, and to create knowledge and ideas that will ha enhance the material and spiritual well-being of the citizens of the nation and beyond. Now, it seems to me that these are also the ideals, the goals of uh, contemporary advocates of the University of Oversight and Control. The purpose of um, tending, uh, especially to students of marginalized or historically oppressed groups, to bring them into the social elite, to create knowledge and ideas that will alleviate the plight of the marginalized or the oppressed, uh, so once again, it's social or non-academic values and goals that constrain and direct academic endeavors and academic engagements. So there's the academic endeavors, the academic engagements, then the university, but these are constrained by this overarching uh, thought that what's really of value, the purpose of the university is to aid individuals in soul making and to aid the society uh, through creating uh, people who are competent uh, at uh, their managerial and professional roles. Uh, so I think uh, the, uh, um, uh, the coming university, the transition into the university that uh, um, uh, might be on the horizon uh, is not, that university is not very much different from the uh, standard universities of the past. Uh, social, um, ideological, political, however you want to describe them, goals and values constrain the academic endeavor. Constrain the academic endeavor. Okay. Uh, uh, questions or comments at this point? Anything to, to clear up? What I've been trying to do is give a sense of um, the reasons people have, people within university communities have for, um, in, uh, for uh, valuing a university of oversight and control, uh, what the motivation might be for that. Okay, now let me ask you a question, um, a question of your preference. Um, I'm not going to ask it publicly. You don't have to tell me uh, in public what your preference is, but here are the options. Uh, would you rather would you rather have true beliefs and sound values, but have true beliefs and sound values as a result of social and psychological pressures on you? We're humans. What do we like? We like to fit in. What do we fear? We fear exclusion. We fear being uh, uh, thrown out. Um, we can uh, uh, get people to believe things, to value things, uh, through psychological and social pressures. So suppose true beliefs, sound values, but as a result of social and psychological pressures on you, primarily fear of exclusion, um, uh, desire for inclusion. That's on, on the other side, um, false beliefs, unsound values, false beliefs and unsound values, but as the result of your own collection and appraisal of what you take to be uh, relevant evidence, relevant evidence, adequate evidence. So on the one side, you believe truly and you value soundly, but not for your own reasons. On the other side, uh, you believe falsely and you value unsounded, but for what you take to be your own good reasons. 
Here you're not thinking for yourself, but you've come up with the right, but you're in the right uh, frame of mind. You've got the right set of beliefs and the right set of values. Here you are thinking for yourself, but you've made some mistakes. You come to the wrong conclusions. You have false beliefs and uh, unsound values. Now you might want to say, well, look, here's what I want. I want true beliefs, sound values, as a result of my own investigation into the world, my own collection of evidence, my own evaluation uh, of the evidence. Yeah, but let's suppose that that's not available. <laughs> uh, what would you prefer? Now, uh, that's for you yourself. Now, let me ask, what would you prefer for those people around you, the people with whom you interact? Uh, maybe not your friends and family, people that you love and care for, uh, but the shopkeepers and the people on the street and the political leaders and all the rest. Uh, well, you might think, what matters to me is that they believe truly and value soundly, because that will make my life and the life of the people that matter to me uh, run much more easily. Uh, it doesn't matter to me how they got to that place. If they got to that place through social and political pressures, um, that's fine. Uh, okay, well, let's take a group. So third, third preference. So I'm, I'm imagining that your first preference is for the uh, false beliefs and unsound values that you got through your own uh, independent thinking. Uh, and perhaps your choice for um, the society at large, St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada, uh, the world is that people believe truly and value soundly for whatever reasons, because you're not engaged with them. Then. But here's the middle group. Uh, this is the people at your university, the people with whom you engage as students, as academics, your professors and your fellow students and the administrators in the cafeteria and staff, and all members of the university community. Um, do you want a university that is attempting to inculcate what you take to be, and perhaps you're right about it, what you take to be true beliefs and sound values, inculcate them in people through social and psychological pressures as indoctrinate them into these beliefs and values, uh, or uh, would you be willing that um, your classmates, your professors have false beliefs and unsound values, uh, but they're engaging with you intellectually? Uh, they're listening to your theories, they're discussing with you um, if they're making mistakes, you're criticizing and the rest. So I'll, I'll leave that for a moment while I have a sip of wine. Now, I imagine a place, and I don't think it's ever existed, maybe never will exist, but to, you know, call it an ideal or an idea from which actual places can be, um, can be criticized. Uh, a place where people who value thinking independently, thinking for themselves, collecting their own evidence, evaluating and praising that evidence for themselves, gather in order to engage intellectually with the things of the world. So, uh, by the way, um, uh, valuing, collecting the evidence uh, yourself and evaluating the evidence, on, uh, let's call that moral intellectual autonomy. Intellectual autonomy, the ability and willingness, desire to think for oneself, moral autonomy, the ability, the willingness to value for oneself, uh, to uh, 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 appraise one's emotions for oneself, one, uh, hold one's uh, patterns of emotional reaction up and, 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 and look. So um, a university where people who value their own moral intellectual autonomy and the moral intellectual autonomy of others who value their intellectual and moral autonomy who get together in order to investigate the things of the world. Well, why do they come together to investigate the things of the world? There are two reasons. One, it's fun. We like to be together. You know, it's good to be with other people and talk to them and enjoy their presence. Um, but the second reason is that other people can see faults and flaws in our thinking, in our hypothesizing, that we ourselves might be blind to. Uh, so uh, we express our explanatory theories of this or that aspect of the world uh, to other people, and other people tell us where they think, maybe they're wrong, uh, where they think we've gone wrong. And that helps us to fashion um, uh, sounder uh, explanatory theories of the world. Um, this 
endeavor I call liberal study. So I made up this word. Um, I'm moving away from the concept of education. Education sounds like there's a goal, right? Uh, what are you engaged in when you're engaged in liberal study? You're engaged in the pursuit of, the, of understanding some matter at hand. And that's what you're, uh, that's what you're doing, that's, that, that's what you're about. Uh, I, I say to some of my students, uh, especially in the upper levels, in the lower levels too, I say, you know, uh, we're not here to learn. We're not, I'm not here to teach. Some learning might occur, some teaching might occur, but it's, it's, it says no teaching ever occurs in my class. But some teaching might occur, but it's all incidental. What we're here to do is grapple intellectually with the matter at hand whatever the matter at hand happens to be. Um, so that's, that's what we'll study. We gather together in order to engage intellectually with a problem that intrigues us. Uh, we gather uh, together because we enjoy each other's company, but we gather together also because uh, other people are better critics of our thought uh, than, than we are. And we hear new things, ideas that we might not have come to ourselves uh, from other people. Now. Um, this is a, uh, a, a different co a, a conception of the university that I think has been a minority or subterranean tradition within universities for as long as universities have existed. Uh, I don't think it's ever really gone away, uh, but it's always been a minority tradition until you know, it became maybe close to a majority view of um, the point and purpose of getting together at a university for a few decades, and uh, now I think it's, uh, it, it, it's on its way out. Now, this is study for its own sake. Okay? The love of study as an expression of the love of study. Not the love of study as a means of educating one so one can take one's place in the managerial professional elite, um, not um, as, uh, study for the sake of creating practically useful theories of the world that people can then um, adapt technologically or, or, or otherwise use. That might happen. But you're seeking to understand things as they are simply for the sake of, uh, of understanding them as they are, guided by curiosity and intrinsic interest. Um, these might be the problems of the day, sure, there's no reason that, the, that what intrigues you isn't a contemporary problem of the day, but it needn't be, it could come from anywhere. Um, now, <clears throat> what would uh, such a community look like? Uh, what would be you know, some, of the, uh, some of the practices in this community? Well, it would be a community of criticism and, and disputation. Uh, it wouldn't be a committee of the celebration of our identities. It would be a committee where, yes, uh, we, uh, we, we, we express our identities, we hold them at arm's length, and they're there for criticism. They're there for reflective criticism, they're there for people to talk about, and perhaps talk about critically. It would be a culture of criticism, a culture of disputation. Uh, it would also be a, um, uh, a culture of robust uh, freedom of expression. Why robust freedom of expression? Well, because you value your intellectual and moral autonomy, so you don't want people imposing psychological, economic, uh, did I say psychological, so social uh, pressures on you, but you, you value your compatriots' intellectual and moral autonomy. Uh, you want them to be free to make up their own minds about things on the basis of whatever evidence they might collect, however they might appraise it. Uh, so uh, you will not interfere with their projects of coming to understand how things are. Um, criticism is not interference, of course. Um, criticize, criticize away. Uh, but there won't be any um, shouting down or uh, disinviting speakers. If uh, members of the community uh, want to invite someone you think is a firebrand or a charlatan, yes, expose this person has a fraud in the campus newspaper or whatever, uh, but don't call for the, uh, for the event uh, to be uh, canceled. Uh, why not? Because you respect the intellectual and moral autonomy of your compatriots. So I think um, from this conception of the university, the university as a um, community of intellectuals, uh, a community of people, each of whom values their own intellectual and moral autonomy, each of whom respects the intellectual and moral autonomy of others, uh, this would be a, 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 a campus of uh, uh, wide 
robust freedom of expression. Now, returning, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to speak this long. Uh, returning to the, uh, the, the list of reasons why one might oppose freedom of expression on campus. I think we can say, you know, from the perspective of one who values uh, liberal study and community of liberal study, that even if wide, robust freedom of expression puts things that matter to us at risk, even if it may, might make um, for unpleasantness uh, to hear things, uh, nonetheless, uh, to honor that which we love, uh, we have to put up with this. Um, I don't think there's going to be a lot of putting up with this. I think criticism goes an awful long way. Uh, but uh, um, the argument against opposing wide freedom of expression on campus is simply that it's inconsistent with something that we love, if we love liberal study. All right, well, I'll end there. Questions and comments? Go ahead. Um, yes, yeah, so I guess my question is, um, well, thanks a lot for uh, giving your presentation. I, I do appreciate it. Um, so my question is, uh, so I did go to a Christian college mm -hmm. um, for my undergrad, and then I went to a secular one for my postgrad. Um, so. So the, some people conceptualize God as like a being out there, like, you know, above the sky. But the classical conception of God is that God is the true, the beautiful, and the good. So when I hear a claim like knowledge itself is inherently valuable, I, I didn't hear that wasn't my claim. Okay. But well, it, okay, when you say that you know, it's, it's valuable for its own sake. No, I didn't. Oh, okay. I, I, I think that, no, no, here's the distinction. <clears throat> uh, to value something intrinsically, we value things intrinsically, whether they have intrinsic value or not. So um, that something has intrinsic value. That might be a reason to value it intrinsically. But I don't think anything has intrinsic value. Uh, <laughs> but so you think, have value. Uh, I value it intrinsically, right. uh, whether it has intrinsic value or not. But, it, but anyway, yes, yeah, so, so, so my claim is about valuing things intrinsically. And uh, I can be agnostic as to whether the thing that's valued intrinsically has intrinsic value. OK, well, that's really interesting, because I, I guess that we're clarifying this. So my question was, and you just, I just you know, the, the way that I'm framing it is that um, essentially the pursuit of any of any object that's inherently valuable would be identical with the pursuit of God, right? And this is a classical, and I think this is kind of the classical understanding of what the university is really for, right? And when you say that, okay, it's not really intrinsically valuable, mm -hmm. but it's intrinsically valuable for me. It yeah. seems right away it's, it's all relativistic, and, and now we're no longer really pursuing any object that's beyond people's sort of whims. Well, but, but that's, that, that's per, uh, perfectly fine for me, if, if someone wants to say it. Um, any inquiry into anything is actually an inquiry into God. Yeah, okay, uh, I, uh, and then we criticize it and all the rest, but uh, there's a thesis, it's on the table, let's, uh, let's, let's discuss it. I, I, don't, uh, um, I, I don't object to that as something to discuss. Okay. <laughs> no, I appreciate your clarification. And, and, and by the way, to, uh, to not to deny that things, that anything is uh, possessed of intrinsic value, uh, that there's no relativism there at all. But, uh, but that's not, that's a wholly different discussion. <laughs> Anyone else? Questions, reactions? I guess uh, one word that you didn't mention that I think in order for a university to be the way that you're Mm -hmm. suggesting there has to be something called humility and it's not that like if someone says well I, I want to have the freedom to investigate what I want to investigate and express my views and then I want to allow other people to do that you can have people that want that for themselves but don't want it for anyone else and the reason they don't want it for anyone else is because they lack humility mm -hmm. and I, I think that's that's one of the big problems. I mean, I brought the, a big problem with the conception by the managerial class or the union. Mm -hmm. the, the, the fact of the union, their conception is that students don't have the right to freedom of expression because that should be reserved for people who self identify as being brilliant. Mm -hmm. But then, how, how do you define that? Or you use terms like, well, we allow freedom of expression as long as what you're talking about is reasonable. Mm -hmm. But that's just kind of uh, smoke and mirrors for saying the people who are the elite get to determine what constitutes 
being reasonable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, um, I, I want, I mean, what is, what is respect for moral and intellectual autonomy? Uh, we express respect for the moral and intellectual autonomy of others uh, by refraining from manipulating them. Uh, if indeed we value the moral and intellectual autonomy of others, uh, then the idea of manipulating them doesn't even occur to us. Uh, but suppose um, you think, well, I could, um, my project could be advanced by lying to this person. But, uh, but wait a second, to lie would be to manipulate, and that's to, to uh, uh, show disdain for that person's moral and intellectual autonomy. So uh, uh, that's a, even though it's an effective way of getting where I want to go. Uh, so if we um, um, are of, uh, if, if we do value our own moral and intellectual autonomy and value the moral and intellectual autonomy of others uh, such that we respect the moral and intellectual autonomy of others, uh, then we're not going to be engaging in um, practices that um, show disdain for moral and intellectual autonomy. Uh, so we're, we're not going to be saying to our students, no, you must pass this in to be vetted first. Uh, before you can say it, uh, because it uh, might uh, go against um, you know, our university chief's ideas. So that wouldn't happen. But I, I take it that the, the essence of your criticism is um, that um, any institution with, I don't know, more than two people, maybe even more than one person, um, is going to need uh, fairly strict rules about about things, because you know we can't. Um, uh, you're right. Uh, humility might not be as widespread as we'd like it to be. Is, is that the concern? Yeah, I think that it's rare. I think humility is rare. I think that there's the argument is always that somebody's going to say, "Well, I believe in that economy for a small subset of people, but most people aren't as smart as me, and I know, and I'm going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to impose my." my viewpoints and others because I've arrived at the truth. Mm. But but I actually think that one of the great ironies, and you brought up faith-based institutions, one of the great ironies is that there are people who attend secular institutions who may have experience with faith-based institutions. But most people, they, they would have had that experience. Most people in secular institutions have no idea what goes on in faith-based institutions. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't enter into that. World. So you have something like CAUT did a big, a, a big investigation of academic freedom at faith-based yeah. institutions, and I find that found that to be quite ironic because because you you could do the same investigation at secular-based institutions mm -hmm. and find the same kinds of religiosity, yeah. to use that term, the same term. And dogmas, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that would constrain academic freedom. And that was, that was my thesis in the first part of the <laughs> exactly. So, so this is the, the irony, in my experience, having participated within faith-based institutions, not as an academic, but having been in those kinds of contexts, is that they actually, in my experience, are more open, even though they have more rules. Mm -hmm. The actual classroom environment is more open to the sorts of moral autonomy you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Even though they may have other structures that yeah. impose constraints on, on students that we don't agree with, and I don't agree with. The actual dialogue that goes on within classrooms mm -hmm. in, in, in contested domains like, let's say, political science or sociology in those kinds of institutions is way more free. Mm -hmm. Then you would get in a place like Brock. Mm -hmm. Can I follow up on these things? I, I think I agree. And you, you study ethics, and so you're probably aware of Alistair McIntyre's book, After Virtue. Um, and, and he argues that a lot of the political debates that we have today, um, we have them, and there's no real resolution, is because both sides of the debate, whether pro life or pro choice or whatever, both sides forget their own intellectual traditions, right? Um, like the Catholics. Would say, would say abortion, that we shouldn't have abortions because sanctity of life will happen, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the, the concept of the, the, the sanctity of life only makes sense in a, like a pre modern sort of, like their own, within their own sort of system, mm -hmm. right? And of course, the more secular counterparts would have their own intellectual system. Mm -hmm. But the problem I have with non faith based institutions is that they, at least in my experience, and this is anecdotal, is that they don't have a sense of 
an intellectual tradition. They don't have a sense of history. And when I went to faith mm -hmm. school, they taught in intellectual history. But if you go to Brock, and I didn't go to Brock, maybe they don't teach in intellectual history. So the, the conversations are, they don't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I, I, I can't comment on that. I, I, I don't know, but uh, my uh, one of the images of, of the uh, a university of liberal study that, that, that I like, it's not my own image, uh, it, it's not one that I came to myself, was um, you know a, a, a tavern where you have a, a, a number of uh, very intelligent people from all periods of history, and they're sitting down talking, and you can pull a chair out. And speak with them, and, and you know Newton walks away, and someone else sits down, and you know that's the uh, that's the conversation, that's the conversation of the university. Um, uh, yes, uh, I'm. I'm uh, well, we get into a, a few different areas here. So, uh, me, well, let me just say um, to acknowledge one of my intellectual debts, uh, I draw heavily on Alistair McIntyre's uh, conception of uh, of a practice. Uh, McIntyre, uh, McIntyre's idea, uh, and uh, I've left out a whole bunch of other stuff from McIntyre, I just don't, <laughs> don't agree with that, don't see. Uh, but uh, according to McIntyre, there's some activities that are such that um, by meeting, that, that, first of all, these activities are marked by standards of excellence. And by meeting the standard of excellence within that activity, one realizes, creates a good internal to that practice. And this is what liberal study is. What is the good internal to the practice? There, there are two goods. Uh, one is that one enjoys the process. A good seminar, right, is a, by, by participating in, helping to create a good seminar, uh, one is producing, one is meeting a standard of excellence. And in meeting that standard of excellence, one is uh, attaining a good internal to, to that practice. Another is the understanding itself. That you generate an understanding, and you have that understanding in mind, and, and that's um, uh, a good in terms of the practice of thinking about things. Uh, so yes, in a, a, a full description of what I take liberal study to be, uh, these ideas from McIntyre would be, uh, uh, would, would, would be central. Uh, and then for McIntyre, there are goods external to our practices. Uh, there are three main goods external to our practices, um, money, fame, Money, status, fame, I think. Anyway, the point of an institution then is to house the practice and to protect the practice. In the real world, uh, money matters. So the institution has to collect money. But then the institution has to distribute that money in such a way that the practices are protected and enhanced. If the institution doesn't distribute the money in a way that enhances and um, protects the practices, then that institution is corrupt. Uh, so, for instance, if a uh, if a hockey league uh, starts to favor, um, I don't know, um, hockey players that are uh, that the uh, commercial interests of Nike shoes or whatever uh, want to uh, promote their brands, if that's now you know how the the, the team is staffed, uh, then that undercuts the, uh, uh, the the practice of hockey. Uh, likewise, at a university, if the um, uh, if the institution um, trades in in money and other external goods in such a way that doesn't promote the um, uh, the ability of the members of the university community to engage in liberal study, then uh, to that's a uh, that's a corrupt university. To mention Alistair McIntyre. <laughs> Other questions or thoughts? So I could talk about something else that was raised uh, in, your, in your question, but I want to know if there's anyone. Anything else? Yeah. I mean, so I'll steer very carefully. So, um, one thing I enjoyed about your talk was that you took pains to, uh, at the start, to enumerate some reasons why people might be suspicious of uh, you know, untrammeled freedom of expression, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, part of the problem right now is that um, this is kind of mutual vilification happening or something. So, if you're interested in freedom of expression, you must be some, you know, right wing troll who doesn't care about all these other progressive social causes, right? Or um, if you have apprehensions, then you're some snowflake, progressive snowflake, or whatever the caricatures are. Right? So, <clears throat> I appreciate that you, you spelled out some logic there, but I guess. You talk about uh, like renewing our 
our, uh, our sense of value and more, uh, moral and intellectual autonomy, and that's something we can all do individually. But I guess I was interested at an institutional level, this ties into your last point, I guess, right? Um, what are some things that, that can be done to um, secure the conditions for that kind of moral and intellectual autonomy, right? It's like, I think in the United States, the majority of people want single payer public health healthcare, right? But it's never offered because the institutional <laughs> structures and incentives work yeah. against that, right? So it's, we can all individually want something or value it, but if the institutional um, structures and incentives work against it, then it's hard to realize that. So. You're, you're not going to like my answer. Uh, I'm, I'm really quite pessimistic about these things. I think uh, our, our, our task, those of us who, who value liberal study, um, I think our task is one uh, to articulate these ideas uh, to uh, generate you know, a, a, an understanding of uh, liberal study so that if uh, times and conditions change such that an institution of liberal study is possible again, uh, the people don't have to begin from nothing. Uh, they'll have, th these ideas will already uh, be present for them. Uh, and the second is to try to create uh, again, this is McIntyre um, to try to create small communities within institutions like universities that practice uh, liberal study, uh, so that the tradition itself uh, might be, you know, uh, physically embodied uh, uh, by people and show it to the public as much as possible. To um, you know, because there are many people who've never encountered thinking for themselves as a way of you know, going about things in the world, uh, in, in investigating uh, what intrigues them um, openly and fearlessly. Uh, so you know, let, let people see it so that they know what it's like and, and invite them in and, and, and try. But you also have to hide it. You know, have to hide it from the um, uh, from certain authorities who would uh, who would come down on it. Um, you know, that's a difficult task. But, um, I, I I don't know. I'm I'm a bit pessimistic that there's any route to um, an institution that takes liberal studies seriously from where we are now, given uh, given these trends. Uh, the, uh, what I counsel is thinking long and hard about our ideal of the university, um, trying to articulate that ideal and those ideas, um, and attempting as best we can to create a small uh, small universities within the larger university. I mean, that, wasn't the, re the revolutionary kind of ideas in the 60s and 70s were coming actually not from that there were faculty members, but there were young people. And, and I actually think that's probably the only real solution is to get students, to give them the ability to speak. Because even if their ideas aren't well formed, I think that's that's where the challenging the status quo is going to come from. Mm -hmm. And I and I've witnessed that. When I was an undergrad, I there was a thing called Speaker's Corner at my university that was packed every single Wednesday, people getting up on the stage and saying very controversial things and contesting. And I can't imagine that being allowed in today's university. Mm -hmm. But that drew in a huge number of Political dissidents among the student population, and some of them were articulate, and so yeah. many of them have gone on to become members of government, who I see in in parliament. And that's like, mm -hmm. I th I think that faculty are going to have a difficult time achieving that because they've kind of reached a point where they want to protect what they have, mm -hmm. and that goes back to the humility. And I think that we actually need to give more space for young people. Yeah. Okay. Good. How, how do you go about doing that? Well, I like to create a speaker's corner at Brock. They, they can't stop like nurturing that. I mean, I do that in a class that I teach. I have, I do that within the class, but I'd like to see it, people being encouraged to be brave. And young people have ideas. And you know. yeah, um, yeah, like you have to say, um, I'm not Catholic, but in Catholic social thought, there's concept called subsidiarity, which pretty much means that, how do I frame it, that when there's differences between people, 
it should be or uh, conflict between people. It should be resolved at the most local level <clears throat> before you kind of mm -hmm. you know appeal to the court. So you and I, if we had a disagreement, we first try to resolve it between us yeah. before we go to the courts, right? Right. right? Um, and then you can kind of take this and kind of frame almost any sort of conflict. And I, I can give you an uh, experience I had. So I'm First Nations, mm -hmm. um, like I got a status card. My mom's a victim of sixty school, and I experienced racism once in a class. Um, you know, but for me, what I find is empowering is being myself challenging somebody one on one rather than having to invoke a policy. Mm -hmm. Like, why do we have to have policies or these yeah. higher up institutions yeah. trying to mediate conflicts that we can resolve just on our own? Well, this is this is because you value moral and intellectual autonomy rather than yourself and others, right? If if you don't, then um, you know, bringing in an officer. Taking it to a uh, to a third party to a judge that, that that seems fine because what you want in that case is not is, is it's not um, resolving it so that you both uh, continue to value your moral intellectual autonomy but you know you want your end satisfied and you think that the uh, that, that the third party will do it. Um, I, I think you know the. Um, uh, Offices uh, under academic vice presidents or provosts or um, uh, deans uh, to deal with conflict resolution and stuff like that. Um, that certainly takes us away from uh, a university of, uh, of, of liberal study because uh, now the, the you know, individual, the relations between the individuals are now mediated by, by third parties and by rules. And, You'll always need another rule. Something else will come up, and more and more and more. Um, I think one of the um, one of the arguments against the University of Oversight and Control, or especially in the, the context we find ourselves in, uh, is that um, the uh, there'll be you know meeting after meeting after meeting, officer after officer, after officer ruling after ruling after ruling, uh, and it just becomes uh, 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 too too heavy, too uh, uh, too weighty. Uh, the um, institutional bloat, the administrative bloat, uh, the bloat uh, beyond that which is concerned with uh, uh, with uh, uh, study and, uh, um, and and research and teaching and the rest, uh, becomes too great. Uh, but on the other hand, I mean, I, I, what I'm talking, what I'm trying to do, what I'm talking about is trying to two visions of, of, of institutions that may well call themselves universities. And on the uh, on the other hand, on the, the hand against us, um, the thought is well, um, what we what we want at this university is not a university of respect for intellectual and moral autonomy, rather a respect for something like feelings and identities. Right? At a university of uh, a university of liberal study, uh, our identities, aspects of our identities, are always at risk, and um, part of the task is. Um, to take the things that matter to you, the, th the things that really matter to you, are part of who you believe you are, and hold them at arm's length for inspection by yourself and by others. This is, on the one hand, potentially alienating, right? Unless you do value your moral and intellectual autonomy, you're not going to want to do that, right? You're not going to want to alienate yourself, even briefly, from something that matters to you. And now it's open for disputation and open for criticism. Right? But a university that uh, takes um, uh, your aspects of your personality, especially those, the, the, those, the, those things that um, have, have come to you, you know, through nature or through uh, very early social conditioning or whatever, um, and, and now those things must be respected, right? rather than interrogated, rather than interrogated, it sounds like uh, cop show or something, it's being uh, um, held up for reflective exam, critical examination the way we do at the university, uh, not inter interrogate like we interrogate a suspect. Uh, but if, if, if um, um, holding them for um, uh, uh, investigation and, uh, and, and critical reflection uh, can distance you from them, right? Um, well, for some that might be um, betraying your group. 
um, uh, if, if it, it, it's going to be psychologically difficult, psychologically unsettling, uh, but it might also constitute a, a betrayal of one's group. And so this is why protecting uh, identities, celebrating identities, uh, you know, would, would, would be a natural thing to do at uh, this other, given this other conception of the universe. Uh, and um, now, one of the questions is, so, so uh, people who are engaged in liberal study because they love study for its own sake, and loving study for its own sake, they're inclined to respect the moral and intellectual autonomy of those engaged with them in their community. Uh, why would people outside this group want to support that institution? Right, because we're doing it, why? Because we love to do it. It's what we love to do. So we get together and we investigate the matter at hand, which might be something very personal, or, you know, might be a geological. It turns out that everything's personal, right? Could be so. So there we are as geologists, and we might be putting some aspect of someone's uh, identity at risk. Uh, but we're doing it because we love it. And so even those people uh, who are uh, vulnerable, uh, their identities uh, are, um, uh, say, more often under attack than other people's. Well, they value this this project, uh, this this endeavor. So they're they're going to uh, engage in it, uh, despite the uh, uh, even for them perhaps increased risk. Uh, but on the uh, uh, but, but then why why should a public support such an institution? Uh, I think there are two reasons. Uh, one, um, and and the first of these reasons requires that we value democracy. Uh, that we value participatory democracy. Um, an institution of liberal study is going to, um, it's not its goal to produce people who can think for themselves, but it's going to do that. It's going to produce people who can think for themselves. And if they can't think for themselves and they want to think for themselves, and they're taking their positions in the professional and managerial, managerial uh, realms, um, they're going to be, um, more competent at their task in a democracy uh, than people who are in their position because they're loyal uh, to the um, uh, to the ideas that uh, uh, under which they were hired and loyal to the uh, uh, to the people. Uh, so uh, one reason for having institutions of uh, liberal study from the outside, people who don't value the endeavor itself, is that it produces young people who can think for themselves. Uh, the second uh, reason is that it produces research that's trustworthy. Now, suppose um, you're at a university and you're investigating something, and um, there's a explicit or implicit view that you have to come to some particular conclusion, or at least you can't come to some set of conclusions. Uh, even if your research is fine and wonderful and you come to the truth, it can't be trusted. Why? Because there are certain avenues that you weren't allowed to go down. There are certain things that you couldn't say without putting your job at risk, let's say, or you know, without putting your funding at risk uh, and, and the like of that. So people outside the university, consumers of research, Consumers of uh, uh, social uh, research, if they're uh, voters, uh, um, consumers of uh, chemical, uh, 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 biological research, if uh, they're consumers, because um, consumers of the research that emanates from universities will want there to be some place where the researchers are engaged in their research for the love of the project itself. And because they're engaged in it for the love of the project themselves, they want to understand the world, they want to understand these things. Um, they're not, their um, uh, beliefs about how things are are not going to be shaped or framed by, uh, by other pressures. Um, people don't trust research that emanates from pharmaceutical companies, let's say. And why not? Well, because a pharmaceutical company has an agenda, has some. But if the agenda of liberal study is simply just to create an understanding, um, then that understanding is communicated to the general public. Uh, they have, uh, even if the, uh, 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 the research might not be uh, true, but at least it's trustworthy. So uh, two reasons why people outside institutions of liberal study want there to be institutions of liberal study in their community. Uh, one, to help young people to be able to uh, think for themselves and to, to generate useful research that's, that they can trust. 
Uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you, Mark McConnell. Thank you for organizing this thing. I enjoyed the talk um, and the conversation. But um, I'm not going to take up the school question now because I'm being out loud. But well, since um, I was an undergrad, you know, there's been an increasing emphasis within the university system on um, inclusion and, and diversity mm -hmm. and what have you. And that's got in hand with the work sensorious culture. Mm -hmm. And over that time, um, what the, you mentioned John Hay in your talk. Well, one, oh, oh yeah, John Hay, okay, yeah. Yeah, he talks about the, the, the notion of concept. I mean, that's what they see in that time is mm -hmm. some sort of con conceptual inflation of bad things, right? uh, whether that be uh, sexual harassment or racial harassment. So when I was in school, I, I was a student in a year course, and I didn't see during my during your office hours and call me anywhere about it's obvious racism. Today, I'm a student in your course and during your office hours, and you know, ask me where I'm from, and that's, you know, well, a microaggression, right? <laughs> Um, uh, and it strikes me that this 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 deflation of mm -hmm. what constitutes a bad thing that's a key weapon used to limit debate or shut down debate. You know, because you, you, you where we listed the, the, the reasons for um, free speech you, or, or academic freedom, you, you, what you were getting at was a tension between. Um, uh, Traditional mission of the university, which is the quest for truth, versus the rights and well being mm -hmm. of traditionally marginalized people. Well, people who um, who can lay claim to victimhood have a moral high ground to, to, uh, to limit the academic mm -hmm. or, or, or free speech. And with, with you have you know, what constitutes wrongdoing continuously inflated, then you know, the easier it is to, to, to lay claim to victim status. And, and, yeah. and you know, the, the more under threat uh, free speech finds itself. So what? how do you challenge it? How do you challenge the <coughs> concept? How do you, uh, um, uh, how do you um, reverse that trend? Yeah. How, how do I challenge it, or how does one challenge it effectively? Probably do. We can start with that. Okay. Well, um, I, I don't know how, how how one challenges it effectively. I think that, I, again, my, my pessimism. That if you look at the mechanisms. Um, who hires um, academic administrators? Other academic administrators. What, uh, what are the grounds on which they hire them? Fit with the institution as it is right now, the compatibility with the goals and ideals of the institution. How do we break into that? I, um, I don't know. Um, safe and respectful campus policies, uh, for instance, are part of this uh, concept creep. Um, the, the, there's the you know, human uh, resourcification of <laughs> the, uh, the, the, uni uh, the university, and the human resources people like there to be these policies because it gives them something to do. Um, but if we have to, uh, to uh, monitor uh, the situation with regard to the safe and respectful uh, campus, um, but how, you know, how, how do we break into that? Um, I, I know what, what I, I have some ideas about what would work. Uh, for instance, uh, academic senates. Um, um, no administrators should be voting members of an academic senate. Uh, they should be um, ex officio members who uh, are there to uh, talk and inform, uh, but uh, they, they shouldn't have a vote. Uh, why shouldn't they ha have a vote on academic senate? Well, they're a block, right? They can't, um, they don't enjoy academic freedom as administrators. Um, they serve at the pleasure of the president. Um, their, um, th th their views are going to be the views of the, uh, of, of the institution. Uh, so uh, they shouldn't have a vote. Uh, the second proposal is that um, members of academic senate should be assigned um, from the faculty by lot. Um, let's not elect them. Um, <laughs> uh, who gets elected? Those who want power. Anyone who wants power is unfit to happen. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but I, I have no idea how these reforms, you know, how, how to try to institute these, uh, these reforms. 
Um, but m my own approach is to do something like what I've been doing here, try to articulate an ideal that, of the university that I think some people will find attractive. And from that ideal, criticize um, uh, current practices as inconsistent uh, with it. Um, but I, I, I don't think that um, that's a particularly effective way of going about things, unless you know the um, unless the idea was uh, really attractive to a lot of people, and I just didn't know that. Right then, we'd have uh, uh, some momentum. Uh, but um, no, I, I, I think you're right. Uh, I think the um, uh, well, I, I often say that uh, everything started to go wrong when personnel began calling itself human resources. Because uh, then their, their mandate became much wider, and, and, and then they became a um, you know a, a, a third. Oh, they became an agent above the, um, uh, the the people who are you know trying to work things out themselves. Well, no longer. It's uh, there's now a codification, and there's uh, some officer to look after these things. So I, I, I agree with the, your analysis. Of the problem, and part of the problem, but I don't know how to uh, how to address it. Just if I could follow up question, simply stating, what do you think your shit started? I mean, did it start within the universe or around John and Kate and Rick and Diana? Let's talk about um, young people, you yeah. know, really increasing beings. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I really have no opinion on, on uh, the, the causes and the, uh, the, the, the history, the pattern. Um, I've read uh, uh, Haitham Dukiana's book, and I, I've read the book by Manning and Campbell. Um, it was uh, Victimhood Culture. Um, so I, I don't know. I think the um, uh, you know cer certainly the, the, there are lots of uh, there are lots of threads from the the seventies and eighties into nineties um, political correctness. Uh, I remember I just read um, a book that was written in the early nineties, and the, the point of the book was this political correctness thing. Don't worry about it. It's going away, right? And you think, well, how naive? But that might have been how it looked. Probably how it looked back then. Um, so I, I, I really don't know. Um, I think on, on the one hand, there's, there's uh, um, you know, from what I from what I've read, I've, I've done no actual research into this. There's the, um, the, the the coming of therapy culture to uh, uh, North American and, and uh, European societies, and I think Christopher Latch and others have, uh, have discussed that, um, and, and then into uh, uh, Manning and Campbell. Um, so there's, there's, there's therapy culture. Uh, some lay a lot of blame on postmodernism. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. If, if postmodernism is anti foundationalist, well, you know, anti foundationalist. Uh, uh, if postmodernism is, is, is the idea that the most interesting thing in the world are power relations, and that we and that we should spend all our time investigating and trying to change our power relations. Well, then postmodernism is uh, for it. But no, I I have no uh, real ideas about this. Can I uh, ask a quick question, Mark? Uh, in your uh, abstract, the talk, you say that you're looking for common ground between uh, two positions. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see a lot of common ground. I see celebration of identity on the one hand and liberal study on the other. 
Where, where is well, common ground you're talking about? What was I thinking? I, I, <laughs> no, I, 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 my, my view is that there is no common ground. Uh, that uh, these are, are that there are at least two fundamentally different ideas. Uh, one of the problems in Canada uh, is it wasn't a, it, in some ways it's not a problem uh, that our universities are all alike. Uh, for one, they're all re reasonably good, whereas in places where um, universities are not as controlled by governments, you have you know really good ones, really bad ones, and a lot of stuff in, in, in the middle. Uh, but no, no Canadian university student is going to a lousy university. Um, maybe some are going to universities that are better than others, but you know, so, so there's the quality control that comes from the provincial oversight and the overlap uh, province to province with, with, with regard to oversight and, uh, and, and standards and, and, and control. On the other hand, that makes it really, really difficult for any university to be a different university. So, um, you know, I've thought, um, um, uh, you know, fancifully, in, in Halifax, uh, there are three major universities. Uh, well, why not divide up the students and the faculty according to the sort of university that they would like? Uh, maybe the University of Liberal Study would attract the fewest students. Well, we'd take the Mount St. Vincent campus, or the smallest uh, campus. Um, and I, I think if there were um, universities that, ex, you know, explicitly took themselves as institutions of liberal study, and other universities that explicitly took themselves as polytechnical institutions, and other universities that explicitly took themselves as um, uh, universities of celebration and identity, uh, then students would have choices. There'd be something like a market. Uh, maybe we would see the university where people gathered for study for the love of study wither, or maybe we would see that, see that it would blossom. Uh, but again, I think you know this is um, a um, uh, uh, an arrangement, a possibility that uh, just can't exist in Canada today with the way in which um, governments oversee accreditation of universities. Do you think so? I mean, historically, before the labor movement, universities had tenure. Yeah. Um, and that protected students. Do you think that. Tenure protected students. I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, do you think that, that labor, the labor movement, is consistent with liberal studies? Uh, uh, yeah, again, I don't know. I, I, um, I have no firm opinions about that. There is there's one. Um, uh, one large tension, right? Uh, what's a union all about? A union is all about solidarity. Um, what's a, <laughs> a group of professors all about? Well, it's about different ideas and different uh, standards, different approaches and all of that. So uh, I, I think that might be at the root of uh, some of the tensions, some of the reasons why uh, unions aren't protecting academic freedom. Uh, in the ways that one would expect they would. But, but again, that's, uh, that's beyond anything I'm prepared to talk about. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's cool. Oh, um, so like before you talked about kind of intrinsic value being like self-generated? No, I talked about valuing intrinsically. Okay, valuing intrinsically. So like, is there anything outside of yourself as kind of like has intrinsic value or does it all come like No, I, I don't think it exists. I don't think it comes from, well, I don't think it's there. I, I, there are things that you love and you love it for your own sakes. There are things that, um, there are some things that you're committed to and you're committed to them because you appreciate their instrumental value in, for something else. Yeah. So for instance, no one wakes up in the morning and says, oh boy, I get to ride the bus today. Uh, but all of us are committed to good public transit. Why? Because we think it serves all these these other ones. Uh, but there are some things that you uh, you love for your own sake and your uh, for their own sakes, and your commitment to them is based in that uh, in that love. Uh, now, of course, being human, there are many things uh, that you love for uh, their own sakes, and and each of them not each of many of them uh, generate commitments, and those commitments can conflict. Mm -hmm. So we can discover you know what really matters to us by noticing that we choose. Uh, to go one way rather than another uh, in, 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 in some conflict. But it's all, it's like differs from person to person, I guess. Some, is this, uh, you know, ask the anthropologist. Maybe there are some things 
that just as humans we all love. Mm -hmm. um, life itself. itself. Life itself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then, like, is that the same then, like, you were talking about, like, like socially kind of enforced value, like good values, right? Like, no, like, would the same values be good for everybody? Well, not necessarily. I mean, patience is a is a wonderful thing for some people in, in some uh, mm -hmm. contexts, but not others. Uh, some people are gregarious. You know, they value friends who are also gregarious, and, and some people are, are longer. I mean, they, they value their, their, their privacy, so yeah. you know, that, that, that can differ. Um, but, you know, suppose that, um, uh, you know, there, there, there's some, uh, well, no, you, you continue, right? Um, yeah, like, so, yeah, like, if it differed from person to person, right, like, I, I guess, like, what you think of as a right value, then, like, wouldn't it be kind of impossible to kind of create a system where everybody, like, thinks the same way, I guess? Yeah, it would. Yeah, or, like, everything is right for them. Yeah, no, uh, I guess. Uh, this is the human condition. Mm -hmm. We want different, ones of us want different things. Yeah, so then yeah. it's kind of, like, necessary to respect each other's, you know, intellectual autonomy then? No, I don't think that follows. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, it, why would I respect your right. moral and intellectual autonomy if by doing so I prevent myself from getting stuff that really matters to me? Now, here's the thing. What really matters to me is that you're able to engage the world through your moral and intellectual autonomy. That's, and, and because of that, that prevents me from um, lying to you and cheating and all the rest, even when lying and cheating would be effective ways of attaining other things that I want. Uh, but I don't want those things as much as I want um, you you to experience life through your moral intellectual autonomy. Okay, fine. Yeah. But uh, am, am I making a mistake if I don't do so? No, I'm not. You know, I, I, might, I, might, I make a mistake internally if uh, I'm preventing myself from uh, fulfilling something that matters to me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> maybe at this point I, know, I, should bring, I should bring the formal proceedings to uh, close, and we can stay on and uh, continue to discuss among ourselves. All right. Sure. Uh, I'd like to thank Mark for a very stimulating talk on. Uh, Subject is really not at all what I expected. Oh, no. And, <laughs> and uh, I thought you were going to talk tuition increases. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming and. Uh, uh, just for some context, uh, uh, Ron tells me that uh, some people were. Uh, opposed to my appearing on campus because I favor tuition increases. Yeah, I have well, never said anything about tuition here, increases. Here, here, but the thing that's interesting to me about that is that, is that, I mean, there were people that opposed, there were people all over that were opposed, and that might be why they're intimidating other people into not coming because it's, you know, they're, they're being told if you go there, you must be mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z. But the interesting thing is that the reason I brought up the question of organized labor is that the faculty union here claims to support academic freedom and yet they made no statement to protect this talk. 